Hey there, welcome to Physical Geography, and this class is an introduction to rivers. In it, we're going to look at some of the cultural aspects of rivers, how rivers and humans are connected, and also we'll look at some of the more technical aspects of how rivers work. The cultural geographer Yi Fu Tuan said that geography is a study of Earth as the home of people, and there's nowhere you can see that better than along rivers. For example, the Ganges River watershed in this picture is home to 400 million people, 5% of the world's population. Over 120 of the capital cities in the world are located on rivers. 42 of the 50 U.S. state capitals are along rivers. And rivers are great connectors. The Danube River crosses 10 different countries, all the way from Germany to the Black Sea in Romania, crossing four capitals along the way. Rivers give us energy as well. 71% of the world's renewable energy comes from hydropower. That's more than wind and solar and biodiesel and all the other renewable energy combined. And rivers are the primary source of protein, not chicken, not hamburgers, but fish from rivers in many regions of the world. The Mekong River system provides 80% of the protein for 60 million people in Southeast Asia, like these fishermen in Cambodia. Let's take a look at the anatomy of a river. At the beginning of a river is called the source or the headwaters. It's usually up in the mountains or hills, a place where there's some combination of three things that feed the river. You have rain, you have meltwater from snow or glaciers, ice melting, and then you have groundwater as well, perhaps springs up in the mountains or the hills. So the rain, the meltwater, and the groundwater, those three things that would contribute to the water in a river. And as the river comes down from the source, it's joined by tributaries, which contribute, add to the river, hence the name tributaries. And it keeps on going through its channel. The channel is the space in the ground, the groove in the ground that the river runs through is called the channel. And then the areas right alongside the river are called its banks. There may be lots of animals and plants that live in those river banks, and that's called a riparian ecosystem. And finally, the river ends, it connects to an, a lake or an ocean, and that's called the mouth. So we go from the headwaters to the source at the beginning, all the way down the channel to the mouth. If you wanted to know why people have been living alongside rivers for such a long time, for thousands of years, one of the key reasons is floodplains. Floodplains are the areas alongside of a river, sideways, that get covered in water when the river floods. So what's happening is essentially the water when it floods is taking nutrients from inside the river, all the dead stuff that's been in there, the plants, the animals, and it's taking those nutrients and putting them outside the river putting them across the landscape, basically fertilizing the landscape. It's a little bit like volcanoes because when a volcano erupts, it takes minerals from inside the volcano and deposits them all around the landscape around the volcano, which is why so many coffee plantations, for example, are found in volcanic soil. And so floodplains are very, very fertile. And they are the most productive ecosystems on the planet because they are so fertile. They're covered in the river sediment that is so rich in nutrients. But there's a flip side to floodplains, a trade-off, where you have so many humans living along floodplains near rivers, and the problem is that can be very, very dangerous because it floods. And so just like floodplains have sustained civilizations for thousands of years, they've also been very dangerous to humans for thousands of years, right up until today. In 2022, in Pakistan, you had massive flooding along the Indus River during the summer monsoon season. You can see in the satellite images on the left, in 2021, 2022, the areas of flooding vastly increased. And so thousands of people lost their property, lost their homes, and had to migrate. The flood stage is the established height where a river is deemed to be hazardous to people, property, and businesses. What that flood stage is, is something that the hydrologists have to decide on. What do they consider to be a hazardous height of the river? And it doesn't necessarily have to be that the river is overflowing outside of its banks to be hazardous. So you might hear, for example, that during a hurricane, a river level rose to the point where it was a meter above flood stage. So it was a meter above the level considered to be hazardous. So hydrologists and scientists, they want to pay attention and monitor the heights of rivers so they can know when they might flood. To do that, they use an instrument called a stream gauge. You see these boxes that they often put next to streams? And on the right, it shows you USGS, it's a US Geological Survey, the main body that monitors streams in the US. At the bottom of the box, you can see there's a little hose that comes out and it goes through the ground and it goes into the stream. And what's happening there in the stream gauge is they're using a bubbler system. So basically 
that little hose sends out bubbles of gas into the river. And the way they figure out how high the river is at any one point is by the pressure that the river is pushing back. And you can see that because it's more difficult for those gas bubbles to come out. So the harder it is for the gas bubbles to come out of the hose into the river, that means there's more water piled up higher and pushing down further with more weight above it. You, from that, you can tell the depth of the river. Rivers are also one of the most common borders between countries or states. There's 219 pairs of countries in the world which have a river border, including the United States and Mexico. That's the most cross border in the world. You can see the whole eastern side of the U.S. border with Mexico is a river. It's the Rio Grande. Millions of people try to cross that river every year. It's very difficult to monitor. The U.S. Customs and Border Patrol has boats that go up and down. They've got drones. They've got helicopters. But with a river that big and lots of wilderness on either side, it's very difficult to monitor. And when you have countries that share a river like that, whether it's a border or whether it's just a river that goes through many countries, then you have what you call hydropolitics, the politics of water. Those countries have to share and cooperate and figure out common policies on things like conservation, transportation, like the ships going up and down, the dams that they're going to put up there, and who's going to get what energy from those dams. All these things have to be considered in hydropolitics. And one of the most important aspects for the environment when countries share rivers is that whatever one country dumps in a river upstream, meaning towards the source, that stuff is going to end up further down in other countries later on. So there might be three or four or five countries that share a river and country X, Y, and Z is going to receive all the pollution, for example, from countries A, B, and C at the beginning. So there's many international agreements about how to manage rivers. Rivers are also a very important means of transportation. And that's especially true for anything that's big, that's really, really heavy, or that's oversized, that's really large. For example, cars are often shipped down rivers and huge containers full of coal and corn and stuff like that. And rivers are really good at connecting the interior of countries far from the ocean out to the sea. So countries that have good navigable rivers have a huge advantage in trade because their interior parts can manufacture stuff and then send that on the river out to the ocean and then out to the world. That's the case in Germany. Germany has the highest GDP in Europe, and Germany is also the world's third largest exporter, which is amazing considering that Germany is smaller than India and Brazil and many other countries that have large industrial economies. And one of the ways that Germany has become the world's third largest exporter is because of its rivers. You can see anywhere in the western part of Germany, they can put stuff on the Rhine River and send it out to the sea. Anywhere in the eastern part of Germany, they can put it on the Elbe, take it out to the sea. And in southern Germany, they have the Danube, which goes east, as we said, it keeps going through nine more countries, all the way to the Black Sea, and then on to Russia. So it opens up a whole world of trade. They can put BMWs and Mercedes on that Danube River and send them out to giant markets off to the east. Rivers have also propelled explorers to discover new regions. Lewis and Clark used the Missouri River to go west and explore the Louisiana Purchase. The Portuguese used the Amazon River and its many tributaries to explore the Amazon jungle in Brazil. And the French explorer Champlain used the St. Lawrence River, which goes from the Atlantic Ocean all the way to the Great Lakes, to explore French Canada and to connect with the fur trade in the interior of the United States. These guys on the screen, the French voyageurs, travelers, are legends in French Canadian history. They basically were the middlemen for fur trading in New France. They would paddle up and down the St. Lawrence River to the Great Lakes, get furs from Native Americans, from trappers and hunters, and then paddle back up and bring those furs to Montreal, where they would be traded and then sent off to France and to Europe. So the voyageurs were like human paddling machines. They paddle for 10, 12, 15 hours a day sometimes. These guys are legends in French Canadian history. Tributaries are rivers that flow into larger rivers. I'll use the word streams and rivers interchangeably here. And tributaries can have other tributaries. So if you look at this map, you have the Amazon River, and one of its tributaries is the Rio Negro, the Black River, and then into that flows the Rio Branco, the White River. And so we have a tributary of a tributary going into the Amazon. You can also have something called distributaries. That's when instead of flowing into a river, a river flows out of a river. 
that happens, for example, when you have floods and the main stem, the main river floods and gets very high, creates a lot of pressure in it. And then therefore the water in the main river is so pressurized that it pushes out and shoves the river back down into the side rivers. So in some cases, the same river, the same tributary that's for most of the year flowing into a bigger river can during flood season then become a distributary temporarily and flow out of that river. The place where two or more rivers come together into a single channel is called a confluence. Confluence, literally con, like with, or together, and then flu, like a flow. Many cities are built at a confluence. For example, on the map on the left of East Africa, you see Khartoum, the capital of Sudan, and Khartoum is built at the confluence of the White Nile and the Blue Nile. White Nile and Blue Nile come together at Khartoum. You see the picture on the right, it shows you the city of Khartoum. And then it continues on as just the Nile, all the way through the northern part of Sudan, and then all the way through Egypt. Another good example of a confluence is in Pittsburgh. When I was a kid, the Pittsburgh Steelers won the Super Bowl many times, and they played in Three Rivers Stadium. It's no longer there, they blew it up. But Three Rivers Stadium is at the junction of Three Rivers. And I looked at a map, and I said, what's the third river? I saw two rivers coming together, the Monongahela and the Allegheny, and then they just keep going. And I could never figure out where the other river was. But then I realized it's just another name because when the Monongahela and the Allegheny come together, it continues, but they rename it the Ohio. So the part that keeps going is called the Ohio. And that Ohio goes all the way across to the Mississippi. And so they can ship stuff from Pittsburgh all across the middle of the United States this way. And that river system really allowed Pittsburgh to become the big city that it is today because Pittsburgh used to be a major steel making city for the entire United States, hence the name the Pittsburgh Steelers. They don't make steel much anymore, but when they did, it's a great example of how rivers can carry stuff that's very, very large and heavy, like giant steel bars for long distances. Hydrologists have come up with a system of ranking streams according to their numbers of tributaries, and that's called stream ordering. You see in the picture, this is a stream order diagram, and basically the smallest streams, little creeks that have no tributaries of their own, nothing else flows into them. They get ones on stream ordering. And so all these little ones are on the outside. And the general rule of thumb is that when you have two streams come together that both have the same number, then you go up one number. So when you get two ones coming together, you get a two. You get two twos coming together in a confluence, you get a three. You get two threes coming together in a confluence and the new river is a four. So the higher the number generally, the more tributaries are behind them sort of contributing to that flow in that river. And these stream ordering systems are used to figure out where the biggest flow is in rivers for, for example, for flooding and things like that, for monitoring, and also to know like what type of wildlife might live in different places. So some wildlife prefers to live in smaller creeks and other ones in bigger rivers with more flow. And so you can see a diagram and predict which species might be where. What makes rivers flow is gravity. Like this gentleman up in the top right, going down that slide, flying down the slide, it's gravity that makes him go downwards. So the river just slides down a slope. And towards the beginning of the river, which is called the upper course, that slope is highest, a really steep slope. And therefore the river's gonna be faster there at the upper course. And then as it goes toward the middle course, it starts to flatten out and get slower. And so finally at the end, it gets much flatter and it gets slowest of all. So the same river that's very fast in the beginning can towards the end, thousands of miles away, be very, very slow. That's true here in the Nile. If you look at the map on the left, you can see the Nile has two sources. The source of the White Nile is Lake Victoria, and the source of the Blue Nile is Lake Tana in Ethiopia. And what's driving the Nile, for example, on the Lake Victoria side is that Lake Victoria is very, very high up in elevation. And so it comes sliding down off of that, very powerful. But by the time it gets thousands of miles away to Khartoum, the city at the confluence of the White and Blue Nile, like the picture on the right, you see it's much, much slower. It's very slow because it's very flat. So the same river that started out steep and fast can thousands of miles away be slow and flat. In the hydrologic cycle video, we said that rivers are in the hydrologic cycle, part of what's called stream flow, flow of water through streams. 
We had groundwater flow, which is called through flow, water moving across through the ground. We had overland flow, water moving across the land itself, across the grass, across the ground, but not in streams. And then we had stream flow, which is water flowing through streams. And there are three types of rivers, types of stream flow. So we have first perennial rivers, then intermittent and ephemeral. Perennial rivers or permanent rivers are just like it sounds. It's always flowing. And I always wondered, how is it possible that rivers can flow? Is it always raining somewhere or is it always melting somewhere? And the answer is perennial rivers have some source of groundwater when there's no precipitation. And that groundwater seeps up from below through the bed of the river and into the water in the channel. So they get water that we don't see coming from the outside. It's coming from underground below up into the river. That's what allows perennial rivers to flow even when there's no precipitation. Then intermittent rivers flow frequently, but have short dry phases. For example, you may remember from the climate section, we said that savanna climates have heavy rains for eight or nine months of the year, but then the rains drop out for three or four months. And so during those three or four months, when things dry up, is when the river would disappear. Here's an example of an intermittent stream in Missouri, in the Ozarks. You see the rainy season on the left, and on the right, it just looks like a path through the woods during the dry season. And the third type of rivers is ephemeral rivers, which are basically temporary rivers. They only flow for short periods. And this is most common in areas where it's just very dry, arid, semi-arid environments. So for example, you see the dry areas of Arizona, and most of the time there's no river there, but when it does rain occasionally, then during the rains and just after the rains, there's a river there temporarily, an ephemeral river. There are certain other situations where you can have ephemeral rivers. For example, on the top right, you see that the Greenland ice sheet, which is kilometers thick, in the summertime, it melts on the top, just the top layers, and that meltwater running off creates ephemeral rivers that run to the ocean. Now let's turn to one of the most important concepts in understanding the relationship between people and water, and that is watersheds. A watershed is the area where all the water in that area, that zone, flows into some common endpoint. And a watershed is something you can put a boundary around on a map, like a line. And that boundary is called the divide or the drainage divide. So if you think of a watershed like a bowl or a funnel, like on the right, you have a picture of a funnel, then all the water in that bowl, no matter where you pour it in, it's going to slide downwards in the bowl or in the funnel, it's going to come out into the same endpoint. And so the divide around the outside, the boundary, like the yellow line in the picture, the yellow dotted line, you could think of that as the rim, the rim of the bowl, the rim of the funnel. And what happens when you go beyond the rim, when you cross out from the bowl of the funnel outside? Well, then you go into another watershed. So if you look at this picture, that bear on the left, standing off to the left beyond the yellow line, he's standing in another watershed somewhere else. So all across the landscape around the world, every part of the landscape on land is divided into some watershed. So in this watershed, you can see all these blue arrows of flowing water in this giant bowl of an area here, whether it comes from water on a farm or water from people spraying their lawns or water from lakes and streams and underground water, no matter where it comes from, melting ice, it all is gonna run into the same common endpoint, that central river, and out to the same lake or ocean. A good example of a watershed is the Mississippi River watershed, which is all across the interior of the United States. This is the Great Plains, the big flat floor in the middle of the United States. So the Mississippi watershed includes all the water that's going through the ground, across the ground, in the streams, between the Rocky Mountains in the west and the Appalachian Mountains in the east. All that area drains into the Mississippi and then out to the Gulf of Mexico. So that includes massive tributaries like the Ohio River, we said comes from Pittsburgh, the Missouri River, the Arkansas, the Red River, etc. It's a huge area. And so if watersheds connect communities, this whole area connects the whole Great Lakes of the United States, the Great Plains, 
in the Gulf of Mexico. Watersheds are also nested inside of other watersheds, sort of like Russian dolls. You can have bigger watersheds and then smaller watersheds inside them. For example, in Virginia, the James River watershed or the Rappahannock, those watersheds are nested inside of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And the Chesapeake Bay watershed is nested inside of the entire Atlantic watershed, all the water flowing into the Atlantic Ocean. So if we were to zoom out and see watersheds on the biggest possible scale, on a continental scale, and where they're divided, then those are called the continental divides, the drainage divides, the rims of the bowl, so to speak, that separate the watersheds on a continental scale. So on this map, you can see towards the east of the United States, we have the eastern divide, the orange line that comes down like this. And the eastern divide is mostly the tops of the Appalachian Mountains going all the way up and down. And so water comes down as precipitation and it hits the mountains. Like you see the picture on the right, the roof, just like a roof, some water goes off the mountains one way towards the Gulf of Mexico and some water goes the other way towards the Atlantic Ocean. Sometimes water doesn't flow off into an ocean. It just flows inward into a lake. And that's the case in the western part of the U.S. You see the Great Basin, that brown line that makes a big sort of circular shape. It's a giant bowl shape between mountains, a giant basin. And so in that basin, the water doesn't flow out to the oceans. It flows inward to lakes like the Great Salt Lake. And I want to highlight a point of confusion that continental divides is a general category. These are the drainage divides that separate watersheds on a continental scale. But there's also a divide which is sometimes called the continental divide. And that's the Great Divide. It goes to the Rocky Mountains there. It's the red line on the map. And you can see it here. So the Great Divide goes up and down North America, and it keeps on going through Mexico, and it actually goes all the way to the bottom of South America. So this divide goes from Alaska, actually, in the northern part of North America, all the way to the bottom of South America. It's called the Great Divide, but sometimes it's also called the Continental Divide. So if you look on this sign right here, they're telling you at a place called Milner Pass in Colorado, which you can see in the star on the right, you can actually go there. It tells you it's elevation of 10,759 feet up in the Rocky Mountains. And it says this area separates the drainage between the Atlantic on one side and the drainage to the Pacific on the other side. How do rivers begin? Well, if we go back up into the hills and mountains, we said that there's three sources of the water. There's the rain, there's meltwater, and there's groundwater, some combination of those three. And rivers start by cutting a channel in the ground, just a small channel that grows and grows over time. And I often wonder, how is that possible? How does just water cut into the earth? Is water really that abrasive? How does it cut anything? And the answer is that water doesn't do it alone. When rivers flow, they carry a sediment load, sediments that are in the water. And that sediment helps to scour out the channel, which is erosion. And the faster the river is, the more sediment it can hold. And there's a lot of terms for all the sediments and the patterns that are in rivers and the sediment load. For example, you see there are some sediments which are so fine that they're just dissolved in the water. Some are really, really light and they're suspended in the water, just kind of floating up there. And then sort of in the middle level of sediments, these smaller pebbles and stuff, they do what you call saltation, like saltar in Spanish, just to jump. So saltation is the ones that are just kind of hopping along the bottom of the river like this because the river has enough strength to sometimes pull them along in the water and then puts them back down again. And then other rocks are so big that all they do is just roll and slide along the bottom. So as rocks move down a river, they get smaller and they get smoother the farther they go. As they go down the river, they're banging and clanging against each other and they're breaking each other into smaller pieces, which is called attrition and they're smoothing each other out, which is called abrasion. And so by the time they get far down the river, you get these very nice, beautiful, smooth rocks, river rocks. So now let's look at the life cycle of a river, how a young river that's just cutting its channel eventually ends up to be an old, vast river like the Ganges or the Nile River. And generally rivers have three stages, young, middle-aged, and old but we'll just break it down into two basic stages of erosion. 
Stage one is called down cutting, and stage two is called lateral erosion. So the first one, down cutting, is exactly like it sounds. The river is cutting its channel downward because a young river has to just establish the channel in the first place, has to establish that there even is a river. So in the picture on the left, you see the river is cutting downwards and it's gonna be a very narrow channel. And it's using those sediments in the river to scour and to cut that channel. The lowest point that that down cutting can reach is called base level. It's the lowest point that a river can erode down to. Usually base level is the same as sea level, but sometimes there's some extremely hard bedrock in there somewhere which prevents the river from down cutting any further. So if a river is young and doing down cutting, then you're going to see it have a V-shaped channel. It's going to be very steep, cutting down like in length through a grilled cheese. And it's going to be a narrow channel. And it's going to be steep on both sides. Look how hard it is to walk on that one side of the river. It's very difficult over there because it's so steep. You're going to have gorges and canyons, these V-shaped landforms. And also young rivers are going to be very fast and turbulent and have waterfalls and rapids. You get rapids when you have lots of big rocks in the rivers like here. And if a river was older, it would already have eroded those rocks out of there. So if you have lots of big rocks in a river, you know it's a young river. And as rivers get older, as they do that down cutting long enough, they're finally going to hit that base level and then they can't go down any further. So then they keep eroding, but now it's side to side or lateral erosion. So after down cutting finishes, rivers go into lateral erosion. This would be more like the middle age and the older age of the rivers. So in lateral erosion, the river erodes side to side and creates bends, which are called meanders. So a meander is a river bend. So for example, here's a stretch of the Amazon River that has lots of meanders. And these meanders move over time. They're always eroding and changing. And when one of those meanders finally bends so much that it connects back at the beginning to itself, it can eventually get cut off and create what we call an oxbow lake, which is a meander that's kind of been sealed off and become a lake of its own. So after many, many hundreds of thousands of years of this type of lateral erosion sweeping side to side, then a river becomes an old river, which has swept its channel to be very, very wide. It's now very flat. It's going to be very slow because the water has all this space to move through, so it can move through slowly. And being flat, gravity is not making it move fast. And old rivers have many meanders and have gone through many past meanders. Old rivers are the ones that sustain major civilizations, like the Nile, like the Ganges, like the Indus Valley, like the Yellow River in China. And old rivers are often muddy because the only sediments they can carry are ones that are suspended. They're just not very fast. They don't have a lot of velocity to pull big rocks along. So you get just fine sediments in there that muddy it up. A good example of that is the Yellow River in China, which literally is yellow because the less this flyaway soil around that region is suspended in the river. We can look at this life cycle of a meander here as you go down the picture. And to see what's happening, we can start at the top. Basically, we have a river. There's a little slight bend in it there. And the red arrow is the water flowing down the river. And the first thing to remember is that rivers are never straight. So you're never going to start with a straight river. It's always going to be some lean to one side, some little curve in there. And as you go down the curve, the water is always going to go to the outside of the curve. It's always going to kind of, in the channel, move over to one side. And that's going to mean that that water is going to erode more on that side of the river. Because rivers are never straight. It's always going to be a little bit curved and more water will flow to the outside of the curve. To understand that, just think about driving in a car. If you're a passenger, let's say there's four or five people in a car, and you're driving along 34 miles an hour, straight, 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 and then somebody makes a left turn, then what happens? Well, you get pressed to the outside. If they turn left sharply, then you get pressed to the right, the opposite side of the turn. 
And that's exactly the same here. You can see that everywhere this river, for example, find a place where it makes a left turn, and you're going to see the water goes off to the right. If it makes a right turn, the water goes off to the left. Centrifugal force pushes the water to the outside of the turn. And you can see that at the bottom as well. It's showing you how the water going around a bend is pushed to the outside at the point called B in the diagram above. On that curve there, the water is pushed to the outside and therefore it's going to erode more on that side and it will push, push, push and create a bigger and bigger curve, a bigger and bigger meander. Where does the sediment go when it gets eroded on the right side there? It goes to the left, it goes to the opposite side. I always wondered how that worked exactly. I'll show you in just a moment. So if you look at this diagram, you see the beginning, the water is coming down, there's a slight bend, and we said the water is going to go towards the outside of that bend, it's going to erode more and more, and that's why the bend gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the meander gets more and more pronounced as you go down. On the second to last picture from the bottom, you can see the meander is so big that the beginning and the end of it are almost connected. In this diagram, you can see that in diagram one, it's almost connected, and then in two, when it finally does connect, the beginning and the end of the meander, then the river just can flow straight through again. It doesn't need to go all the way around the meander. So the quickest route, the path of least resistance, is just to go straight through, and that's what most of the water does. On top of that, remember we said that it's going to erode to the outside of the turn, and it's going down and making a left turn, and therefore it's going to erode to the outside on the right, but then we said also it's going to put the sediment from the right on the left. And that means it's going to choke up the mouth and the end of the meander. So the beginning and the end openings in the meander are now going to be choked up with the deposited sediment coming from the opposite side of the river. So basically that seals off the meander so it's no longer part of the river at all. It's just a lake. And as we said, we call that an oxbow lake. And what's interesting is that that's not even the end of the life cycle of the river because the river keeps going. Notice that in that last picture on the bottom, that little curve there, that curve is going the opposite side of the original curve at the very top. The first river at the top, that was bending around down like this, and this one is bending up a little bit like this. So what does that mean? That means we're going to do this all over again. We're going to have a whole other meander life cycle but on the other side of the river over time. And this is what rivers do. They go through decades and centuries of creating meanders and then cutting them off as oxbow lakes and then creating meanders on the other side. And that's how we get a landscape like this, the Rio Negro in Argentina. This is a river that erodes very fast, so you can see the process of meanders happens very, very quickly. Many, many meanders are created and then sealed off as oxbow lakes and disappear in a short amount of time. And that leaves the landscape covered in what we call meander scars, the leftover impressions of the meanders that have been in the past. And the fact that rivers can shift and move like this is a big problem for communities sometimes. If you build a city on a river and then the river just moves 20 miles away, then you have a problem. So this is one of the reasons why communities will often channelize a river, which means you put cement in there, you engineer it so that the river stays in place. But that then has consequences. Sometimes that can lead to erosion further down. So it's another one of those trade-offs in environmental science. One thing that we want to know, often for safety reasons, is where the fastest flow in the river is, and the slowest flow. And the way to know that is to know where the deepest part of the river is, because the fastest flow in a river is going to be over wherever the deepest part is. It's going to be on the surface and over the deepest part. The surface, because the surface is farthest from the friction of the bottom, so the water can flow fastest. And to kind of follow that fastest flow, to sort of trace it along on a map, we would have to just have a line that traces the deepest points in the river at all points along the river. And there's a name for that. It's called the Falwig. It's one of the great words in geography. Geography borrows a lot of words from a lot of languages. And so you get a lot of funky words in geography and Thalweg is one of the funkiest. So Thalweg is simply a line 
connecting all the deepest points along the river. So you can see on the left, the cross profile, the foul wig there, the deepest point. And the same thing on the right, because all the way down the river, it's just tracing the deepest point, the foul wig. So if a river is straight, then the deepest point, the thou wig, is going to be in the middle, like at point B, the middle diagram on the left. You can see the thou wig is going to be in the middle, and the fastest flow will be right above it, right in the middle at the top. That's going to be the fastest flow in the river, on a straight river. But where the river is bending around meanders, we said that it's going to flow to the outside and lean to the outside of the river. And that's going to make the thou wig, the deepest point, move to the side. And so the fastest flow around bends is also going to be at the top, but off to the side over the thou wig. And you see that here in this picture. So this is important to know because if you're hanging around near a river, if you're doing kayaking or whitewater rafting, or if you're just picnicking or whatever, and you want to step into that river and you test the waters near the sides of the river, on a straight part, you figure, oh, okay, that's not that bad. I can handle this velocity of the river. You should realize also that if you go further towards the middle on that straight part of the river, that could be double the speed of the side. So it can be very dangerous to go out into the middle of a river because it's much, much faster than the sides. And we said that we wanted to know how exactly that sediment moves from the outside of the river where it's being eroded. How does it get over there to the inside? There's something called helicoidal flow. So you have the flow of the river downstream, the stream flow in general, but there's also this secondary flow of a loop called helicoidal flow. It goes around in a cycle like that. You see in the bottom, towards the bottom of the diagram. And what that's doing is they're taking the sediment that's being eroded on one side and it's looping around and depositing it on the other side as something called a point bar. So now we've seen a lot of the cultural aspects, and we also got into some of the more technical, physical aspects of rivers. We've seen how young rivers erode over time, cut a channel, and become older rivers, which then sweep out very, very wide. And then their floodplains are so big that they can sustain major civilizations. And the Ganges River is one of those. India was born in 1947. Modern India was created in the partition of India. The British packed up and left. And then two new states were created, India and Pakistan. The first prime minister of India was Jawaharlal Nehru. And here's a quote from him. The Ganges River, to me, is the symbol of India's memorable past, which has been flowing into the present and continues to flow towards the ocean of the future. And so in this quote, Nehru points out that, as we said earlier, rivers are great connectors. And the Ganges River, like a watershed, is connecting India, connecting a people, not only in space, but also in time, in the past, the present, and the future.